which has shown us that this industry is as innovative as any other industry and the action is happening here. We are really pleased to be part of Pier 71 and this Smart Board Challenge. Yeah, we're really excited to be in the finals, but becoming third is even better. We're going to continue our journey. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've been keeping safe wherever you are. Thank you so much for tuning in to our live event today, the SmartPod Challenge 2020 launch. I'm Ming, Program Manager at Pier 71, and that is Port Innovation Ecosystem Reimagined at Block 71. And Pier 71 is a program co-founded by the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, MPA, and NUS Enterprise, the commercialization arm of the National University of Singapore. I'm joined by my co-host Jessica from MPA and Jessica, I think we have friends joining us for the first time and probably from various different time zones. Can you share what SmartPod Challenge is? Yes, sure. Thanks, Ming. So welcome again to everyone. If you're new with us, SmartPod Challenge is an annual competition for technology startups all around the world to reimagine their solutions for the maritime sector. The challenge is Pier 71's flagship program and is co-organized by MPA, and US Enterprise and TNB Ventures and supported by Enterprise Singapore and the Singapore Shipping Association. We're in our third run this year, but it may just be one of the most exciting ones yet, with 17 innovation opportunities from 16 organizations. Now stay tuned as we share more about the challenge in the next segments. And that is my cue to share the program we have in store for you today. We will first hear from the Chief Executive of MPA herself, followed by the Deputy President, Innovation and Enterprise of NUS as well as the CTO of MPA. They will share their encouragement, updates, insights, and the importance of innovation to the maritime industry, especially in the current climate. We will also learn about SmartPort Challenge, what's in store for you, for startups, for investors, corporates, and many more partners. We have 17 innovation opportunities this year, and you will get to hear from the corporates who put up one of them, what they're looking for. And I believe you also meet to our, our SmartPod Challenge alumni who are female founders and they will share with you their journey on SmartPod Challenge and beyond. Last but not least, we will also hear from an industry veteran who was a COO of PSA as well as someone far away, all the way from Israel, the Doc Innovation. And that is a really exciting lineup for the afternoon. Are you sure we have enough time, Ning? Well, we'll try, but if you have any burning questions, please submit them to the pigeon poll. Simply scan the QR code on the screen and key in SPC 2020. And we'll answer these questions during the breaks. Now, I think Lehun is already on the line. Uh, let me check. Yes, she is. And without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Kwa Lehun, Chief Executive of MPA, to open today's program. Thanks, Ding. Thanks, Jessica. Now, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I really miss being able to see you and meet you in person, but we all have to stay safe. So I'm glad we are still able to hold this event thanks to technology. As we are now shifting our mindset to preparing for the new normal, it is useful that we gather here to discuss innovation opportunities in this difficult transitional period. Because now, more than ever, we need new solutions. And it is something that MP has always and will continue to support. I thought I'll share with you three messages today. First, we must keep moving forward. COVID-19 brings with it supply chain disruption, but it also brings about opportunities for greater collaboration and partnership for both internal and external audience. In Singapore, we have kept our port open to continue to bring goods in and out. We worked with over 50 ports around the world on a common declaration to keep the global supply chain going. We rolled out financial package and support for the, such as the Maritime Singapore Together Package for our companies. Now we now have a need to prepare for the new normal. And this leads to my second key message, that we should seize opportunities to accelerate digitalization and come up with innovative solutions. We must move forward with the help of greater technological adoption. COVID-19 has shown how crucial it is to build digital capabilities. For example, late last year, Singapore rolled out our digital port at SG portal to facilitate digital transactions. And we now have more than 500 shipping companies on board today. 
Today's Smart Port Challenge event is one key platform to develop innovative solutions for our maritime companies. Now, I had a quick look at the 17 challenge statements that, has been, uh, come, uh, that we come up with for this year, and I saw many relating to smart ships and smart ports. This is highly relevant and will strengthen our maritime sector for post-COVID recovery and beyond. Thirdly, my message is we must move forward together. We have been working with public and private sector stakeholders to ensure business continuity. New partnerships can and must continue to be forged because it's not just about resilience, but also about nimbleness, about creativity and coming up with new solutions. Together with SSA, the Singapore Shipping Association, we recently launched the Mint Fund call for proposals to build greater post-COVID resilience. Now, these are projects that require collaborative effort across the sector, targeting greater workforce, operations and service resilience. We, work, we hope that we could work with all of you here, startups and entrepreneurs, to develop innovative solutions for the industry. The time is right for escalating digital initiatives in the port and shipping sectors. Last year, we partnered with ESG Seeds Capital to attract VCs and corporate VCs to the maritime sector. And this year, we are pleased to announce our Pier 71 VC partners, InnoPort, PSE Unbox, PCL, Porsche, and TNB Aura. We all have a common goal to deepen the maritime startup ecosystem. They also bring together a combined funding of more than 47.5 million Singapore dollar to enhance our support for startups in the sector. Let me now conclude. I would like to thank two groups of people for making this event a success. The Expert Panel and Maritime Innovation Task Force for working with our maritime corporates to curate the challenges, as well as to all of you for tuning in to this virtual launch. I hope that you can find some real exciting opportunities and potential partnerships. Thank you all, stay safe, and all the best to you all. Thanks, Leibun. And next up, we have Professor Freddie Boy, Deputy President, Innovation and Enterprise, NUS. I hear that many NUS startups and spin-offs are contributing to the fight against COVID-19 right here in Singapore. Let's hear more from Prof Boy. Good afternoon, Prof Boy. Good afternoon. The past few months, COVID-19 has wrought challenges and disruption at home and worldwide. Enterprises in all forms and sizes have been racing to pivot or risk business failure. The maritime sector remains vital from the movement of essential goods, food and medical supplies to supporting trade and supply chains. Our NUS community of researchers, innovators and entrepreneurs have rallied and come together to tackle COVID-19 heads on. This includes startups rapidly scaling up efforts to launch rapid tests, providing and moving critical medical supplies, helping local businesses transform into digital platforms, providing jobs, internships, opportunities, and supporting local community generously. In exploring new markets, some of these startups may have found applications for their technology in the maritime sector too. One example, SafeLight, a hygiene tech startup, has developed technology that will allow for the continuous disinfection of high-risk surfaces, such as doorknobs, lift buttons, using light that is safe for human exposure. SafeLight has created a system that can provide round-the-clock protection against microbes. Another example is BrainPool Tech, a drone tech company which addresses disaster management needs. Using a combination of visual analysis, geolocation data, and artificial intelligence technology, BrainPool Tech can create interactive 3D maps, track area activities, flag out areas of concern and even create navigation routes. Having started talks with the local authorities, they will be exploring the use of drones to map out strategic locations and the use of AI to help with area surveillance. 
such as the enforcement of safe distancing measurements. Tier 71 and Smart Port Challenge is part of our larger effort in developing deep tech and industry relevant programs. It is even more pertinent now in helping to address real problems that have been identified by our maritime corporates who are really ready and able to adopt viable and innovative solutions. Some of our other flagship programs include, number one, the NUS Graduate Research Innovation Program, or GRIP for short. Launched in 2018, GRIP is an intensive program that starts with a three-month accelerator phase to enable PhD, masters, and postdoctoral students and scientists to transform research into deep tech startups. We aim to grow up to 250 companies over a five-year period. And the third run concluded at the end of last year, we already have graduated 56 teams. Collectively, $8 million has been invested in these companies. Safe Light and Brain Pool were from the last and first cohort, respectively. Last year's Smart Pot Challenge also saw a group alumnus, Dravam, clinch first place with their innovative idea to use multi-phase flow modeling to detect bunker quality. Well, they just received $50,000 grant from MPA and are working closely with maritime corporates to develop the solution even further. Second, Masters of Science in Venture Creation. This is our new entrepreneurship-centered one-year master's program, and it is a multidisciplinary program providing immersive experience and exposure to startup ecosystems in Singapore, also ASEAN, and leading ones around the world. Students will work with real technology and learn about business models and market validation, and also experience internships in Singapore-based startups. The cohort will have a distinctly Asian profile to facilitate access to the Asian markets. Third, PhD by innovation. This PhD program focuses on long-term and technology-based research. The program will involve intellectual property generation on top of journal publications. And each PhD student will be trained by NUS to translate his or her research findings into a startup company. Fourth, the NUS Overseas College Graduate Program. The NUS Overseas College or NOC program for undergraduates has become iconic, not just in Singapore, but around the world. This is an addition because we are now focusing on graduate students. That is the existing masters and PhD degrees by introducing entrepreneurial, sorry, entrepreneur, per, by introducing uh, enterprising perspectives and overseas immersions into the graduate programs. Besides increasing NUS global linkages, the NUS graduate program will provide new opportunities for technology-focused entrepreneurship, equipping students with principles of design, research commercialization, and realization of technology potential. At the same time, the graduate students returning from the NOC program will enrich the local enterprise community with their deeper technological capabilities and perhaps seeding deep tech enterprises to diversify the local startup scene and create products that are protected from competition due to their IP and higher barrier of entry. Fifth and lastly, 
our NUS Technology Accelerator Program, TAP or TAP for short. To cultivate the growth of not just startups, but more defensible and sustainable startups, TAP is a short-term program that provides a better understanding of what is deep technology, tips on building deep technology enterprises, and allow privileged access to NUS IP technology and resource networks. This will be suitable for even for those in traditional organizations who want to harness technology for new businesses or seeking innovations with existing businesses. There is little doubt that the post-pandemic economy will be quite different from today's scenario. We are grateful that our partner MPA uh, for undertaking the journey with us. We welcome entrepreneurs, innovators, and startups far and wide to assess our ideas and technologies and to be part of our community. With your support, we hope to navigate today's choppy water and image unscathed and stronger on the other side. I wish everyone well, and I hope you have a fruitful and thought-provoking panel discussion later. I look forward to seeing the exciting entries for this year's Smart Port Challenge and hope to see all of you in the final. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for dialing in this afternoon. Next, we'll hear about MPS support for digitalization from Kenneth. Let me check. Kenneth, right, you are on. Hi, my name is Kenneth and I'm the CTO of uh, Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. Now, why would you as entrepreneurs or startup consider investing in Maritime? Today, I'd like to share with you three fundamentals that may interest you. Let me start off with the ecosystem we have been working for the past three years for you. We have plugged ourselves into the core startup ecosystem and established peers and one. Beyond the physical presence, we bring the ecosystem players from government agencies, investors, industry partners, Institute of Higher Learning, researchers and students for the economy. Mentors, R&D capabilities and fresh perspective with funding from VCs would be a enabler for your livelihood and to provide you a nurturing environment for you and your teams. Next, we cultivate and encourage your prospective customers to build up innovative capabilities and demand. We do that by encouraging them to have a blueprint to a measurement of their digital maturity. And we also provide them marine time innovation playbook to guide them to generate a roadmap of innovation initiatives. Marine time innovation cycle then will leverage on the Smart Pot Challenge and the Marine Time Innovation Lab as launching pads for many of these innovation challenges. We also provide resources and funding to support some of these POC, POVs to encourage the marine time companies to collaborate with you. But how about for SMEs? Well, we also have for SMEs, marine time companies, SME Go Digital, which is off-the-shelf products, which when you have developed into a commercial products, to allow them to just buy them off the shelf and get funded for. We also train your customers, the marine time companies in the digital skill set, so that they are ready to collaborate with you. To sustain this network, we have created the Circle of Digital Innovators Network in the marine time. And the circle of HR innovators to encourage the HR and the maritime innovators within the organization to work collectively to transform their companies. This, your customers are now more ready to collaborate with you with great challenge statements and demands. Lastly, we set a compelling platform of the next passport ecosystem to spur your customers and yourself 
to come together to bring solution to the cross port. Technology such as AI, IoT, blockchain, energy, autonomous capability, cybersecurity, and other relevant technologies will be a great enablers for setting up this cross port ecosystem using technologies. Therefore, we think that we have three fundamentals right, and we will strive to make this innovation ecosystem conducive for both maritime companies and, and entrepreneurs like yourself. And with that, we wish you all the best for this year's Smartport Challenge 2020. Thank you. Thanks, Kenneth. Now, for those of you who have just joined us, I'm Jessica, and this is my co-host, Ming, and we're launching Smartport Challenge 2020. Now, we just heard from MPA and NUS Enterprise, and next up, we'll be meeting the rest of the Pier 71 team and finding out more about what Smartport Challenge 2020 will be like. So, are you ready, Ming? Sure. Let's go. Welcome everyone to this special segment when we introduce Smartport Challenge 2020 and we are very happy to have with us today or rather this afternoon, Mark from NUS Enterprise. He's the Program Director for Pierce 91 as well as Desmond from NPA and that's Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. Welcome Mark, welcome Desmond. Um, so shall we just dive straight into, into introducing Smartport Challenge 2020 for, uh, to our audiences uh, this afternoon? Yeah, sure. Right. So let's begin by telling them, or at least introducing who are the maritime corporates that are joining us this year in Smartport Challenge. We have all together 15 corporate partners with us from three business categories, port, shipping, and maritime services. On the port, we of course have PSA and Jurong Port. From the shipping side, we have shipping companies like uh, Ocean Network Express, Eastern Pacific Shipping, Pacific International Lines joining us for the first time. And from Maritime Services joining us for the first time as well, Oil Spill Response Limited, Alpha Ori, and Usen Logistics um, coming on board. Thanks, Desmond. This sounds like a broad range of maritime corporates. I suspect it's probably a broad uh, topics of innovation opportunities as well. Perhaps can you share with us a little more about these opportunities, maybe some unique ones that you'd like to highlight, and also what kind of startups are we looking for this year? So altogether, we have 16 co corporate challenge statements being put up and one open category call for maritime decarbonization in co-created by NTU Ecolabs. Uh, for this year, this is our fourth year, and we have seen how it evolved over, over time. And what is unique this year is that we have pulled together common industry challenge. For example, is the challenge statement on robust testing and monitoring of drinking water quality on board vessels, which is supported by three corporate partners. This attests to the industry needs and opportunities available in this area. Another challenge statement that we're looking up is to consolidate industry use cases require, requiring AI solutions. This calls for promising startups with strong AI capabilities in the area of business optimization, data analytics, and vision analytics. In addition, we are also looking for proposals from promising startups in the area in relating to smart port, smart ships, and green technologies. And if you are a promising startup dealing in those areas, submit your proposal to us. We'll validate your work with industry partners to give you an opportunity to showcase them. Thanks, Desmond. Um, so we would like to also know with all these corporates joining, right? So what is it that they are putting in to help our startups that are selected? So our corporates will be putting up various support to the startups. Firstly, startups participating in SmartPort Challenge 2020 will get industry to will get access to industry partners, and industry partners will also be providing time to share their expert knowledge 
on their problem statements with the startups. Besides providing expert knowledge, industry partners will also be sharing available data with startups to help them shape their potential solutions. Industry partners can also provide test bidding opportunities for startups developing their prototype and by supporting them in their grant application to MPA. Thanks, Thanks Benjamin. Benjamin, for highlighting the grant. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, grant that MPA is extending, especially to the Smartport Challenge finalists? So the grant that MPA is extending is for startups participating in Smartport Challenge and being selected for Peer 71 Accelerate. Startups participating in the program will get an opportunity to apply for the grant of up to $50,000 provided by MPA to develop their solution and test bid their solution with industry partners. Okay, and you mentioned this Peer 71 Accelerate. Uh, maybe Mark, could we find out a little bit more about the program, the timeline, some of the key milestones that we can expect? Yeah, sure. Um, Peer 71 Accelerate is, um, is the program uh, together with what uh, Desmond mentioned earlier on. Uh, while the corporates uh, participating in Smartboard Challenge help the startup uh, uh, to understand the problem statement, to handhold them, uh, developing an innovative solution for the industry. Now, this program, which is called Peer 71 Accelerate, is meant to give, it's a structured program, it's meant to give the participating startup uh, some kind of a head up to be able to work well with the corporates. Now, so what will encompass in this program is that uh, they will meet the problem statement. I mean, they'll meet the problem owner and to understand the problem statement better and uh, to understand every detail that they need to deliver. And they will also be taught with a structured curriculum on product design as well as market validation. Because the objective here is, is to, for them to tweak whatever technology and solution that they already have into the application that required by the corporate, at the same time, use that new application also to find a bigger market, all right? So you can see the end objective is to, for, to help the startup to take root uh, to develop a business in Singapore. And because of that, we will also uh, be inviting industrial experts to, um, to talk about industry uh, landscape to the startup. And, and also we will, give them some uh, structured curriculum on market expansion. So the startup will be well equipped how to go about uh, starting something new in Singapore. And we will also be covering about uh, some essential on features, essential stuff or collaboration, such as like legal stuff and the process that people need to take note into, uh, in particular legal stuff and also uh, how to draw boundary for collaboration. And last but not least, uh, pitching is an important part in this whole exercise. So uh, the participating startup will need to know how to sell, how to feature their products uh, and their services. So that will be part of the uh, training here as well. Now, uh, at the end of this whole program, um, uh, it is not just uh, uh, one, I mean, it is a very uh, interactive and immersive kind of a training. Uh, the participant will be required to obtain some letter of interest from the corporates. So not just the participating corporates, but they will also need to go out and uh, look for potential new customer, validate their proposed solution with them and obtain as many letter of interest as possible. Now, all this is not just uh, doing for the sake of the number, but really we want the startup to really uh, able to develop, open up a new market and take root in Singapore. Thank you, Mark. That sounds very interesting. And, and we can definitely hear that there's a lot of focus on maritime. But I want to ask, so is this program only for, car, for startups that are already in the maritime industry or are we looking for a lot more different uh, startups to join us? Sure, that is a very good question. Um, well, um, 
Well, the objective here for this smart pot challenge and for Pier 71 is to bring innovation into the maritime industry in Singapore. And the best way, and we all know that one of the best way to bring innovation is for the adjacent industry. So something that worked well in another industry, uh, now it can be brought across to another industry and often that means innovation. So certainly, uh, we want to uh, start out from non-maritime industry to come into the maritime industry but really it doesn't matter uh, whether the startup is already in the maritime industry or not in the maritime industry i think what is com what will commonly bind them together in this smartboard challenge exercise is they will have to find a solution a new way of doing things a disruptive way and a, a, a creative way to offer to the current problem so that is most important and, and when that is being fulfilled, uh, we welcome startup from, from every industry. Great. I guess that is where the reimagination comes in, right? So that's why Pierce Anyone's name has reimagined in it. That's correct, yeah. So it sounds really exciting. What are some of the key dates and that startups can remember and that we can look forward to right now? Okay, uh, good question. Now, uh, so where we are today is 4th of June, so uh, that's where the Smartport Challenge launched. And what this means is immediately after this um, uh, program, you will be able to go to Pier 71 website and uh, take a look at the innovation opportunity. And your whole registration process will start from there. It, it will, the whole website will tell you step by step to do the registration. Now, the closing date or the deadline for the submission will be sometime uh, beginning of August. Tentatively, will be 10th of August. Yeah. We, will fix, we will inform you, uh, you will find these official dates later. So once the program is, the, the submission is closed, uh, we will go through some intensive evaluation uh, and some of the team might be called up for some interview in between to, uh, for us to seek clarification. Now, by the mid of September, uh, you should be informed whether you're successful in, 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 your, in your attempt to, for this smartphone challenge. Now, every year we take in about 20 teams, uh, but this number really is not fixed. We are more rather, we are rather more um, uh, motivated to get good and innovative solutions into this ecosystem rather than uh, bound by feeders. Now, the Pier 71 Accelerate will start uh, around the last week of September and it will go all the way to the middle of uh, November. So roughly, it will be six weeks, uh, six weeks kind of uh, duration. So meaning uh, at the end of the program, which is the middle of November, all the participating team will put through some kind of um, judging and um, uh, they will have to do pitching at various levels. And the fight, the and they will go through one level after another, and the final one will, will be presented at the platform for grand final, of which three prizes will be given awarded for the top three teams. And these three prizes are first prize ten thousand sing dollar, second prize five thousand sing dollar, and third prize three thousand sing dollar. Now, perhaps I should add that uh, all the participating team uh, in the Pier 71 Accelerate will also be qualified, be made eligible to apply for the MPA grant. Thank you, Mark. Uh, perhaps very briefly, we're in a very different and challenging and unique situation with COVID-19 uh, looming above us. So how is this going to affect the Smartport Challenge uh, program subsequently? Perhaps just to share a very brief uh, you know, idea and overview so that um, startups that are with us currently uh, who are online but then they're not based in Singapore would have a, a good idea as well. Okay, uh, thanks Nim. Uh, I must say um, generally business as usual so it will not be affected. Now what this means is we have already been running Pier 71 Accelerate in the online mode. So uh, some overseas participants, by the way, uh, in general, we have around 40% of our participants from overseas. So uh, they have been attending, uh, doing this uh, Pier 71 through, I mean, Pier 71 Accelerate program through online mode. 
But this year, of course, given the current situation of uh, COVID-19, by default, uh, come September, uh, all the teams will, be, will, will go through the program through online mode, including those that are physically present in Singapore. Nevertheless, uh, for the pitch day, uh, in past years, we have made it a point that all participating teams must do their pitching with a physical presence in Singapore because this is what we ask from the, from the participating startup that they will subsequently need to be committed to start a business in Singapore and that journey really starts from the pitch day. However, for this year, um, of course, we will review the situation uh, come near November and we will make known to you in due time uh, whether the pitch day is to be it, the, this grand final pitch is to be done in online mode or not. But by default, it will be a physical presentation type. Thank you, Mark. Um, suffice to say that there, the, the one highlight of SmartPort Challenge, uh, well, especially for the finalists during the accelerate part, is actually the networking opportunities. And I know this for sure because the past few cohorts that we run that has consistently been the highlight that our alumni look forward to. Uh, and I suppose even if there is COVID, if, well, COVID-19 is going to be around for quite some time, but uh, even with COVID-19, we'll be sure to bring the gaps and the distance closer. Uh, we'll make it happen. Uh, so our selected finalists will be able to continue with the networking, which is you know, a key highlight of the program. So well, that kind of marks the end of our segment here today with Mark and Desmond. So we thank you very much for tuning in and thank you very much to Mark and Desmond for joining us uh, this afternoon so that we are able to give our online audience, our friends from all around the world, a brief idea of what Smartport Challenge is and what they can look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, and that's SmartPort Challenge 2020. You can find out more about it on our website, www.peersanyone.sg. And I think we have time to take some questions, Jessica. Let me see. Um, well, we have one interesting question. Would it be possible for graduate students from other countries, such as Canada, to take part on the challenge? Now, this question doesn't mean that we have uh, someone from Canada who's dialing in right now. Hi, from Singapore, I hope you're keeping safe. Um, the answer is yes, it is possible. We have had, ta we've taken in uh, teams, uh, graduate students, uh, startups from countries outside Singapore. In fact, some of them relocated to Singapore at the end of the program because they saw, or rather they found opportunities for the startups to take flight. Um, and you will meet one of them later on when we have the alumni sharing segment. Uh, we will make it possible for teams who are outside Singapore to participate in the rest of the program once selected. And I think we do have time for another question uh, that is, what is the requirement for participation? Is an idea or a team and willingness to work sufficient or should we already have a prototype? Yes, I think that question is probably asking what stage of development does a startup need to be at? We actually support our startups from all stages of the development. So even if they do have a prototype, that's good. They can work, find even more customers to refine and validate their solution further. But even if they don't, they just have an idea at a conceptual stage, that is also possible if the review panel deems it as an innovative idea that can be taken further. So yes, we welcome startups at all stages of development from the early conceptual stage to those that are already in the market and are looking for more customers to validate their solution. So that's two questions. Uh, keep the questions coming. Once again, you can find the QR code on the screen. Just key in SPC 2020 and we will try to answer these questions along the way. Yeah, that's right. So for the next segment then, we've invited representatives from three organizations. That's the Singapore Shipping Association, Asiatic Lloyd and Bernard Chalte Ship Management. So I guess we'll be diving deep into one of the innovation opportunities we have in SmartPort Challenge 2020 this year. So let's go and check in on the corporate members. Hi everyone, welcome back. So earlier we heard from Desmond and Mark about uh, the SmartPort challenge and the challenge statements that they are. So now in this panel, we're going to find out a little bit more about one of the 16 challenge statements. So this was a common topic that was submitted by three different 
corporates. So we thought we'd bring them together. And we thought it'd be interesting to have a panel to find out a little bit more about what this problem is about, what's the current state of affairs, and what's the kind of solution they are looking at. So let's dive right into the panel. Thank you, Jessica. So today we are very honoured to have with us uh, Captain Naveen from Singapore Shipping Association, Tonsi from Asiatic Lloyds, as well as Hyman from Bernard Schulte Ship Management. So without further ado, can we invite Captain to introduce himself? Uh, we will go around uh, with Captain Naveen and then Tonsi and then Hyman. Hi Ned, uh, Ning, thank you very much for inviting uh, me to this panel discussion. So I'm re I represent uh, Singapore Shipping Association. I'm on the International Committee as a member and uh, otherwise I'm a freelance consultant and uh, specialized in HSC environmental consultant. I'm also a sustainability consultant uh, specialist. So that's the, it's the passion for the environment and the anti-plastic which uh, sort of drove this whole thing in the SSA committee discussions. And that's how it sort of started off from the SSA. That's a brief background on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Captain. Tonsi, we would like to hear a little bit more about yourself as well. So, hello to everyone. My name is Tom Chudunic. I'm fleet director of the company Asiatic Lloyd. From Singapore, company Asiatic Lloyd is owned by Munemann family from Germany and together with the sister company Atlantic Lloyd is owning and managing uh, 34 vessels. So we are owner and uh, ship manager of our own vessels. Uh, I'm working for, uh, for owning family for about 18 years uh, and I start uh, from the chief engineer, superintendent, and last five years as fleet director. So actually I'm technically overseeing uh, the ship management part of the uh, of, uh, company. And last but not least, we have Hyman. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hyman Sinafius, and uh, I'm the investment manager of InnoPort in Singapore. InnoPort is the Bernard Schulte Group's corporate venture capital arm, and I'm in charge of startup investments in Asia. The Schulte Group uh, owns a fleet of about 100 vessels and manages around 600 through Bernard Schulte Ship Management, and is also active in various verticals and maritime services. As InnoPort, we usually invest in early stage ventures in the maritime space and are keen to collaborate with startups. Apart from the monetary investment, we have a lot of opportunities within the group to test out technologies and can act as pilot partner and customer as well. So we are uh, happy to be part of the lively Singapore maritime startup scene and of course, Pier 71 in particular. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So we we'll go right in. So the title of your challenge statement is Robust Testing and Monitoring of Drinking Water Quality on Board Vessels. So perhaps from a very layman perspective, maybe could you help us to better understand what this drinking water quality even is? And from a layman, I would think you can have bottled water on board a ship. What's, what's wrong with that? Why, why can't we just keep loading up bottled water at each terminal? Uh, so maybe I can have Tonsi to help with that question first. So you see, uh, the, the domestic water on board of the ship, uh, it's, I will say, same like at home, uh, used for drinking, cooking, uh, washing. Uh, so on board of the ship, uh, there are two types of the water. There is technical water, which is used for machinery, steam generation, uh, cooling, uh, and so on. And there is domestic water, which is used in accommodation for, uh, for purposes uh, of, the, of the crew services. The crew on uh, the water on board, it's uh, produced uh, by ship's means. So by means of fresh water generator. So that's device uh, which from seawater is uh, producing uh, fresh water. Technologies are, uh, let's say, different, can be evaporation, evaporation can be reversible osmosis uh, and so on. And the water from evaporator or from fresh water generator, it's directly filled up in the fresh water tanks. Some ships, they have designated tank for domestic water some ships are having common tank for domestic and for uh, for technical uh, technical water. So the usually the the tanks of the ship depends on the size of the ship uh, and depends on the number of the crew members. Here I will focus mostly on the commercial shipping, so no passenger ship, no ferries, uh, because that's let's say different industry where uh, the passenger is uh, main cargo. Here we are talking about uh, 
conventional commercial ship uh, container bulk carrier tanker with 20 25 crew members uh, and which is producing water by their own their own means so the the water when it's produced uh, by fresh water generator is pumped in the tanks uh, and there the water is uh, stored there that one is actually first drawback uh, of the of this let's say problem cleanliness of the tank uh, this usually the there is legal requirement to clean the tank at least once per year disinfect it usually the crew is using the simplest method using vinegar uh, and that's done uh, let's say on yearly and if necessarily can be done uh, done even more uh, more frequently for consumption of the water it's used the uh, hydrofor system so that's let's say one pump or two pumps with hydrofor tank which is pressurizing the water to the 5 to 6 uh, bars to reach highest uh, level of uh, level in accommodation and then water uh, it's passing mineralizing unit and sterilizing unit so mineralizing unit is passing just uh, because the water is pure evaporate so in that water it's there is uh, no any minerals there are no any impurities uh, in theory and that water will be let's say tasteful for uh, for consumption it's added artificially minerals so actually the principle is very simple same like mother nature did it uh, so the water is passing through the stones or uh, or sand which is releasing the minerals and which are remaining in the in the water after that the water is passing through the sterilizing lamp which is killing uh, all germs uh, living organisms uh, and so on and that's that's it now water is coming to accommodation there to the users uh, the users on board usually are galley for food preparation drinking water fountains uh, that's let's say device which is in the corridors of the of the of the ship where crew members can drink the water which is pre-chilled uh, pre-chilled and which is sterilized uh, and taps uh, in dispensary so that's our uh, main users of drinking water uh, depending on the ship design uh, uh, the the water in the cabins uh, it's not for drinking uh, this water it's clean but it's not for drinking so it can be used for shower uh, for flushing of the toilet uh, for for the teeth brushing but not for drinking uh, even it's bacteriologically in the in the order so that yes yeah uh, go on so that's production of the uh, production of the water but sometimes production of the water on board of the ship is not possible because uh, devices uh, uh, or system is out of order or under maintenance sometimes you have coastal vessels uh, which are uh, sailing too close to the coast where it's not uh, uh, recommendable to produce the water because the effluent from the shore uh, various industries and so on can contaminate uh, the, the water and then in these cases uh, the ship is taking water from shore so coming in the port uh, the ship is connected by ordinary hose uh, to the hydrant in the port uh, so as you may imagine the things are not uh, really sterilized or sterile, sterile uh, so you are connecting to the ordinary hydrant uh, and you can uh, you are never sure what kind of water will be pumped because for this water mainly you are not getting any certificate so the captain is ordering uh, this water 50 or 100 tons of the water uh, there which is pumped uh, in the tank and that's it uh, so uh, the the water on board of the ship it's uh, analyzed uh, by uh, laboratory shore or uh, or on board minimum twice per year so that's legal requirement as per mlc convention uh, some companies are doing it more frequently our company is doing it quarterly but uh, we find it insufficient uh, there because even if somebody is doing uh, this analysis uh, every month uh, 
you never know what kind of water you produced. Uh, you never know what kind of uh, living organisms start to multiply in the water, in the tank, in the pipeline, in the hydrofor unit. Uh, and you never know if your sterilization unit, uh, like sterilizer, is sufficient enough. Uh, and these are reasons why most of the owner opt for the uh, uh, supply of the water in the bottles, plastic one and a half bottle, uh, one and a half liter bottle, uh, to be on safe side. Right. There also there are drawbacks uh, because if you are, uh, let's say, calculating that ordinary person can drink three to four liters per uh, of water per day, which means, uh, let's say. Uh, 2.6 bottles uh, per, per day per person. I will say a uh, seaman is drinking four liters because it's working hard in the engine room, very hot, he's working on the deck, very hot. So let's let's say four liters of the, of the water uh, per day means 2.6 bottles uh, per, uh, per day. When you see on the ship 20 crew members, that means 53 bottles when you add something for the galley and so on you are coming up to about 60 bottles uh, per day. Well, that is a very big problem. It looks like um, that yes. testing, um, I mean, water is essential, right? Although the vessels traveling on vast amount of water in the ocean, <laughs> that doesn't guarantee us uh, fresh water and, and potable water. And that is, that is something that is very astonishing to me. But I want to ask Captain though, uh, is this problem, uh, I'm sure this problem is, is not just plaguing um, Asiatic Lloyds. Uh, I'm sure you've heard from other members of uh, Singapore Shipping Association as well, uh, lamenting the same problem. Uh, so, but with the bottled water, um, even even though it ensures some kind of supply of portable, portable water um, to the crews, but I'm sure it poses other challenges as well. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have Asiatic Lloyds or uh, Bernard Shooting uh, Ship Management reflecting that you know this is actually a problem itself, or like they're actually looking for a solution to this problem. Hey, hi, so uh, the, I think we just need to go back about 20 years in time and yeah. go up to about 2001. So till about 2001, 2002, all merchant ships, uh, you know, used to consume water from the tanks. I mean, I mean, like Tom sees there, he's consumed water from tanks. I've had water from tanks in all my sailing days, 17 years. So we drank the tank water. And as Tom C said, uh, as he's a marine engineer, you know, you uh, they, every ship had a purification system which is, you know, the pass through the ultraviolet filtration, et cetera, et cetera. And we get good, clean, mineralized water, which is, even if it's generated on board, you need to mineralize it. And we used to get that. So somewhere, somewhere around 2001, 2002, there was a shift. And that's where gradually the, the seafarers uh, uh, started realizing that they need to pick up some water from the, uh, from the bottles, that is the plastic bottles. And with that, what happened is the tanks, which used to be clean, the purification system, which used to run well, that gradually started getting a backseat. They were neglected by ship owners and ship managers. So something that was already functioning till 2001, 2002, started getting neglected by the ship managers and even by the classification societies, they also did not ponder over this. And eventually it came a time that uh, the tanks were uh, not clean enough to, uh, to have water which could be consumed uh, as potable water. So uh, the water that was coming in from the ports that was procured, or whatever was being generated was being used to wash, you know, for your bathing purposes and for washing, etc. But not for drinking. So eventually, what you needed for drinking is you need to get it, you know, in the what you call uh, uh, the mineral water bottles. And so that that was a tendency. Now that has over the last 18, 20 years become a practice. Right. And uh, and now today the ship the shipping companies are when they pick up water from the ports, that's mainly for washing purposes or for bathing, but not for drinking. So drinking water is, uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's now a foregone conclusion. Majority of the ship owners are taking water in plastic bottles because th that's a safe bet for them. Uh, the other issue is there are some ship owners who have started the change in the last uh, two, three years, and they've achieved a, a, a great amount of success changing over from the bottles to uh, the tanks. Of course, this requires a bit of mindset because the seafarers have got used to drinking water uh, from the tank. So they believe psychologically that the, the water on the bottles is safer and the tank water is not clean. So there's a psychological factor, 
which needs to be uh, addressed and there's a technical factor which which is the water part the water has to be you know uh, portable it should be term portable it should be tested and people should be confident that they can have this water safely and that this water is better than the bottled water so there are two two parts so right now the, the key issue is that some of the uh, companies do have uh, test kits on board and they do carry out tests some of them are doing it on a monthly basis some are doing it on a quarterly basis uh, some flag states like norwegian flag state they have got a requirement with states you have to do a test on a monthly basis in fact norwegian flag state has also got certain regulations that you have to carry out the following test i think they have something like eight chemical tests and they have a microbiological test for testing for some bacteria and then they have a physical test so you need to carry out that test so they uh, uh, so that is a benchmark uh, which can be used and they are doing it but uh, uh, most of the other flags do not have anything specific on this uh, issue this is very interesting so for the ones who test um monthly right is you're saying that um uh, is that kit like some kind of a point of uh, you know like like you just you just do this simple strips and you test it uh, that they supply uh, on every vessel that they have or is it something that's very very specialized you need some kind of machine or you know I think I'm thinking about is it like a pregnancy test kit equivalent <laughs> or is it something that you need like a machine to test yeah yeah no it's not like one of those strip tests which you just put or something like that so it's a little bit more because there are there are actually three uh, different tests which need to be carried out one is the physical itself that means how does the water appear how does it smell etc then there is a chemical test which is the chlorine content the ph value and things like that there are about four or five including iron then there is a microbiological test which requires certain tests whether you have e coli or any other bacteria which is harmful so there are i think about uh, three or four uh, on the bacteria side so these tests uh, will not be done by a strip but there's a kit so the chief engineer on the ship is capable of carrying out this uh, these tests and uh, and many of the companies have adopted this and they actually carry out the test and post the results you know on the notice board well this is interesting problem so it first started off with um, vessels having their own filtration system then it got abandoned because there was somewhat uh, lowered confidence the bottled water came in it was convenient it was it was sure confirm can drink it's portable but now it becomes a challenge uh, and it becomes increasingly difficult to go back to using a filtration system because probably people the system has not a lot is is not used for a long time already so it's been it's been that way right and we are trying to go back to using it but then you also want some kind of assurance uh that the system's um robust perhaps you want more new features uh to to make sure that people can go back to using it uh confidently but i think we're also interested to know from uh ship management companies um what exactly is the drive uh to solve this problem perhaps we can have time and share with us uh you know from that perspective sure um there are of course various aspects to to this problem statement and uh for one is of course that the safety and well-being of our seafarers is our greatest priority and one of the basic requirements is uh, to provide them with clean and safe fresh water so for drinking as uh, as it has been mentioned we currently provide them with uh, bottled water as the bottled water quality is not monitored constantly but rather by external labs in re regular intervals and that is of course uh, a mindset issue as well uh, but uh, tap water on board the vessels is also used for washing hands showering etc and we as ship managers have of course the responsibility to ensure that the water quality is always good um, and uh, therefore constant monitoring uh, will be something um, very beneficial to to our operations uh following from uh, providing bottled drinking water is the problem of plastic waste uh, the the water comes in single use plastic bottles all of them hence we generate a vast amount of plastic garbage as tonsi mentioned which uh, would not be necessary if we had the possibility to have a drinking water dispenser at different areas in the ship and reusable uh, reusable bottles and um we as Bernard Schulte uh, want to be on the forefront when it comes to reducing plastic waste on board and this should be one of the next steps so on top the growing concerns about single use plastic uh, trigger also regulatory restrictions which of course we need to adhere to as well so to summarize our motivation and the drive behind it we need and want to provide seafarers with high quality drinking water safe water for showering um, and the galley of course as well and at the same time want to reduce single use plastic to support the environment 
And can, can we perhaps find out a bit more about what the solution should do? So I think you've hinted at that. It should be constant monitoring. But maybe uh, is there other, are there other things that the solution should have? Like perhaps should there be some kind of an alarm system that goes off if it's past a certain level of, uh, I don't know, micro like, organisms in the water? So maybe can we have perhaps uh, Tonsi to take that question? Maybe your top three wish list that this solution can deliver. Well, I would like to add before, I explained the, the wish list, uh, how serious problem of plastic is. Uh, before I mentioned that every crew member is consuming 2.6 bottles per day. And assuming that there is in the world around 1.6 million of CPRFs, uh, that's one rough figure uh, there. So when you add uh, that maybe 70% of them, they are active uh, at, uh, at the time of calculation, uh, multiplying 2.6 bottles per day by 365 days in the year by 1.1, 1.2 million of seafarers. And uh, assuming that the plastic bottle can be shrink at 10% of the volume when you are compressing it uh, there. At the end, the seafarers yearly are generating around 170,000 cubic meters of the plastic bottles shrink at 10% uh, of, the, of the volume. 170,000 uh, cubic meters, that's size of one Cape size bulk area. Uh, so that's just uh, in addition to see how serious problem is from ecological uh, point of view. But now coming back to the, to the, to the question and the wish list. Yes, the system must be robust uh, uh, because uh, the, the water should be checked uh, from microbiological side, so living organisms, uh, colis, and so on, but also from the, from the chemical point of view. So the device ideally should be installed on the system, same like uh, the sterilizer is installed on the system, supply system, device like this should be also installed. And uh, ideally, device should have simple function on off. So when any of parameters, which are, uh, let's say, by World Health Organization, defined as minimum criteria for the potable water, when any parameter is exceeding the value, that water supply will be shut. That's a very simple, uh, simple thing. Yes, alarm function it's possible, alarm function is uh, recommendable, but uh, to be 100% sure that the things will be fail-proof, then the shutdown uh, of the water supply should be performed and until the things are not rectified, yeah, unfortunately, the drinking from the bottle will be again. So that's, uh, uh, let's say, the the uh, how the system the system should work. Uh, I guess will be not easy to design uh, this because so far nobody uh, nobody come to that uh, to that point. Uh, but uh, uh, to be on safe side and that uh, the person drinking water on board will know at every moment that this what he is drinking is fit for use same like when he's opening the plastic bottle that he is sure that somebody in the factory which filled up uh, this bottle was checking it, filling up by the standards uh, required, same to happen on the ship. That's interesting. What about uh, Captain? Do you have the same wish list or is there something else that you wish this solution could do? Uh, yeah, you know, just, just a few things uh, uh, like um, uh, what, uh, you know, uh, the earlier was said about the bottled water, there's a Channel News Asia study and there's a report on Channel News Asia which, uh, which has carried out uh, 250 bottled water samples and which clearly mentions about uh, the presence of microplastic. And these are top brands, you know, I mean, like it's, it's, there, in the, it's there in my paper which I've written, top brands like Aqua, Aquafina, Dasani, Avian, uh, Nestle, etc. I mean, the top brands have this microplastic. So this is a Channel News Asia, which I've uh, published in the paper, The Plastic Epidemic, in which it is uh, quoted there. So, and this, so the fact is that, uh, uh, and the other thing which uh, which comes to is that, 
it may not be possible to have something like a cutoff, you know, like something which rings up and which stops the water supply. Because if you look at it, in a typical scenario in Singapore, we get the water from the tanks and we, we consume the water. So there's no cutoff there that something goes wrong and the water supply stops. The, 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 the purification system takes place as per PUB standards and it is delivered into the tanks. The tanks have a cleaning cycle and uh, whatever cycle it, it, uh, the, the PUB may have uh, prescribed. And then eventually, you know, you and me get uh, water in the taps and that's what we drink. So in, in reality, because I've, I've also been associated with a couple of projects of mineral water manufacturers in 1999, 2000. So I'm familiar with the process. Now, when they bottle, they have a cutoff. You know, they, they have an alarm which stops that. But, but that's for certain uh, tests. So right now, I think what we need is not necessarily a cutoff, but we need an examination as on a monthly basis or something like that on the ship, which is being uh, there, which is some companies have it. We just need to get it in place in some sort of a regulation so that uh, companies uh, do it, uh, you know, overall in the sense that this process uh, of changing over from the bottles to the tanks uh, will not happen overnight, not because of technology, but because of the mindset of seafarers. It can take a, a couple of uh, years before they can actually start changing. So there's that issue. And I think you did mention something about passenger ships. So I have some figures with me. Passenger ships are about 314 passenger ships globally with uh, about roughly 537,000 passengers, which generate about 2,400 2, tons of plastic bottle waste. And from the ships, that is the merchant ships that we have, which are close to about, uh, we generate something like 7,900 metric tons of plastic waste only from bottled water every year. So there's a huge quantity of plastic waste that is being generated. And there's another very interesting thing, which, which is the uh, Bottled Water Association says that only 23.4% of the bottles are recycled. The rest of it goes in, in perhaps anybody's guess where it goes. And so there's a lot of it circulating into the oceans, you know, which is uh, contaminating, which is a concern. And uh, coming back to your, your question was on the regulation side. I think we, we just need to have, uh, this PUP has already got a regulation, which is as per WHO, but that's very intense because they're supplying water to millions of residents uh, in Singapore. So basically, uh, the, and a water export expert, you know, needs to sort of define which are those a few elements which we need to test on the ship, which, which is just satisfactory, you know, in sense. And then at the end of the day, uh, ships will be getting uh, uh, water from the port, you know, whichever port. So the port authorities need to have some standard. So once that water is delivered on the ship, the ship carries on their purification and test and delivers it to the user. Okay, thank See you. It. So we, yeah, we, we've heard about what the expected solution should be like. Maybe we can also look from another angle, which is what are some of the potential adoption challenges that there could be that a startup should bear in mind when they think about uh, having a potential solution. So I think it was hinted that psychologically that may be one of the uh, barriers or regulatory. Uh, yeah, so what are these, some of these adoption challenges? Maybe I can have Hyman to think about the question. I guess maybe from a corporate um, perspective because you'll be the one adopting the solution. Sure. Yeah, I mean, this, of course, uh, depends a bit on what the solution will look like that the startups uh, propose. And I mean, uh, what we've heard today, there, 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 may, uh, there will be sensors involved. And uh, if there are, or if there's a sensor and device in the central supply pipes, um, this uh, obviously would have been, um, would have to be used and monitored by the technical crew. So generally, the operation uh, of the system and the basic troubleshoot would need to be handled by the engineers. Even repairs and regular service could be done when the ship is in port. So there, obviously, uh, would need to be uh, need to be training, need to be collaborating the the corporates and the startups for this to work uh, to work effectively. I mean, the main thing for the um, for the solution, I think, is that needs that it can be retro uh, as also so even more than contamination in the piping, etc. Especially because that, since it's not only the tanks, but also the piping that can carry uh, bacteria and the likes. Um, another solution might be to also have a water sensors on the only on the tank or the central supply pipe, um, at least for let's say several water dispensers or the uh, or the galley. For example, a green light showing safe to drink and a red a red one raising alert that something is wrong. So depending on the complexity of the system, the servicing, of course, uh, needs to be done by external parties, but uh, this uh, should be discussed when we hear the startup's ideas. 
Right, uh, Captain, do you have anything to add on to, um, to what Hyman mentioned as well? Any extra more, um, challenges yeah. or anything? Yeah, of course. You know, the, the thing is that the ship owners need to also understand that there is a financial saving for them. They can save about something like 10 to 12,000 US dollars per ship per year. So if they've got 10 ships, you've got about 120, 130,000 dollars a year per, uh, uh, for the 10 ships. And in that 130,000 dollars, they can conduct three crew seminars globally, you know, and invite the crew for training, etc. So there's a huge amount of money that's, uh, because there's a, there's a huge cost they pay in procurement of bottles. And there's another cost they pay for disposal of bottles. And uh, so there's that cost and they can, they, can, they can save money because the cost of water is just $10 a ton. And, uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you get that, you just need to reactivate the purification system. I don't think we need to go into any very elaborate uh, alarms and cutoffs and, and alerts or anything of that sort. I think Tonsi, you know, he's been managing that on ships. He knows purification system what we had 15, 18 years back. We just need to activate that. And we just need to define a standard, which is something like the Norwegians have defined, you know, very simple standard, which chief engineers can follow. And I'm sure when they've done it, they must have consulted some expert uh, in water that, uh, and because the, the WHO standards are extraordinarily elaborate, but that's because they're catering to millions and billions of people in a township or in a, in a country. So their standards are different, but for a ship, you know, when they are getting water from shore authorities, which is already clean or uh, generating on board, which is already sort of uh, in deep waters clean. So these standards can be minimized, the test standards. So this sounds like a huge industry problem that uh, has a lot of potential with a lot of corporates. And uh, as a startup in, like, undertakes this journey, it'll probably be quite a difficult or long one rather. Maybe can we find out from the corporates, um, what are some support that you would give to startups in this journey? Uh, now and, and also perhaps later on if they are awarded the PL71 grant, uh, what kind of support can they expect? Uh, so I think anyone can take this question, but maybe we can start with Tonsi first. I think before we have the answers out, I would like to uh, mention this because those that are dialing in right now are mainly the startups who are looking to participate in the Smartphone Challenge. I'd just like to reiterate that at the end of the challenge, uh, for the finalists that qualify, uh, MPA is going to provide them with uh, a 15000 sing dollars uh, grant for them to do some kind of prototype development or even a pilot test uh, with the corporates uh, that are interested to partner with them uh, in this journey. So I think that's why I'm, that's the background why we're asking this. So MPA has come up with the grant, but what about uh, this kind of support that um, the startups can expect from the corporates? Perhaps uh, Tansi can, can go first quickly. So, uh, what uh, uh, what the startup can expect from uh, from us, Asiatic Lloyd? First of all, in development stage, uh, they can uh, get from us all kind of technical expertise uh, there. So we are ship owner, we are ship manager, so we know how the system on board is functioning, and we know what should be result of it. Uh, so it should be very simple for installation. Uh, should be aff affordable price and should be something which is reliable uh, with, uh, with the results. So we can guide the startup in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, after the prototype is uh, done, we are offering a test bed on the, our vessels. Uh, so if startup is from Singapore uh, there, many of our vessels are calling Singapore. So the things can be installed. Uh, things can be tested and our crew will be willing to participate uh, in, the, in the test. And at the end, uh, there is also financial part uh, there, depending on circumstances, co-investment is always, uh, always one of the possibility. So that's what Asiatic Lloyd uh, can offer. From Hyman? Um, this kind of support that they can expect from uh, Banach Strategic Management as well as in the port clubs. Sure. Yeah, I mean, speaking from a CVC perspective, there's of course always uh, the interesting, challenging part of uh, collaborations between uh, startups and corporates. Mm, um, as a corporate, we of course need a practical, cost efficient solution that can solve our pain point here. Um, and startups hence need to present pragmatic solutions that address the challenge specifically. And here we encourage out of the box thinking uh, for that, of course. Uh, we are certainly eager then to support startups um, that provide solutions to this challenge statement and are prepared to do so in, in various ways. Uh, we, of course, uh, 
with uh, the fleet that we manage uh, and own, we have a great deal of expertise in our, within our organization and our technical colleagues will, will be there as sparing partners for the startups or for discussions on how, is the, how a solution can be made workable. This may be especially helpful for startups that uh, do not have a lot of experience on board vessels. Uh, furthermore, with 600 vessels under management, we have frequent port calls in Singapore and can provide uh, fairly quickly test bedding facilities uh, for startups. And then lastly, with InnoPort, uh, we also have a dedicated vehicle to invest into, into interesting startups and provide them then with the necessary guidance to build a business from the, the pure idea. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had a very uh, interactive uh, session today and this is definitely a challenge statement that uh, is interesting for the startups to take part in because it's massive, uh, not just in terms of the scale of the problem. I mean, we have a lot of vessels that require, I mean, we have so many crew, uh, crew members or seafarers that are on board uh, the vessels and there are so many vessels that are traveling across uh, the, the oceans uh, every day. So um, there's also great financial gains um, because for the corporate, if it saves money, if it saves lives, if it saves the environment, you know, it, it's those big three uh, reasons. Um, so the startup should definitely look into it. And with the Smart Port Challenge uh, prototype grant or pilot project grant, there's more reason to participate and there's great support from the corporate as well. So this is definitely a challenge for those startups that are looking at this problem to, to tackle. And it's only one of the 16 that we have in Smart Port Challenge 2020. So, but before we sign off, I'd like to thank Captain um, Naveen, Tonti, and, and Hyman for jumping into this call with us today. Um, thank you very much for spending time with us. And I really hope that we will see you uh, very soon in person uh, in, in one of our Pure 71 uh, events. Hopefully, maybe in the in the grand final this year. Fingers crossed though. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That is one intense discussion though. So well, if you just join us, I'm really sorry we're running slightly late for the next segment, which is a sharing session by our alumni. Uh, Let's not keep the ladies waiting too long. Hello, Christina. Hi, Nidhi. Nice to see you again. Um, for those who just joined us, Christina is the co-founder of uh, one of our 2019 alumni uh, in Smartbird Challenge uh, from C-Log. And Nidhi is actually one of the alumni in the 2018 run. And she co-founded Podcast. So we're very happy to have you here again with us at one of our Peers and Anyone's uh, events. Uh, today it's mainly uh, the launch program for Smartport Challenge 2020. And we will be talking a little bit more about your experiences uh, being one of the finalists uh, for Smartport Challenge. And, um, but before we begin, can we have a very short introduction about what you've been doing? Uh, you know, we haven't really met up since, I don't know, uh, January uh, with COVID-19, but we are really eager to find out what you've been up to uh, recently. So maybe we can start with Christina. Yeah, well, we've been busy here in Singapore, uh, even though um, COVID-19 hit us in, was it early March, I think? Um, it's actually just opened up new opportunities for us, which has been really positive. So we've, uh, we've experienced new opportunities here. Mm, yeah, Christina actually just relocated from, was it Netherlands uh, last year? No, yeah. Denmark. I'm so sorry, we have quite a number of our foreign startups uh, join, who joined us in Smartport Challenge last year. And Christina is one of those who came from uh, Denmark and relocated to Singapore uh, after the program. So um, Christina, can you tell us what C-Log does? Yes, of course. We're almost three years old. And as you mentioned, we are here in Singapore. We relocated the headquarters. Um, the last couple of years, we've developed a shared platform for the maritime industries where we're bringing together the different stakeholders all the way from the seafarer to the training centers, maritime authorities, and also shipping companies where they can easily assess and verify the documentation on the seafarers. So what we do is that we basically remove the need for middlemen to physically check and verify the certificates and other documentation. And we do that by automating the process of verification, which is done manually today. 
And right now we're testing this with the VW here in Singapore as part of the MPA grant we got from the Smartboard Challenge. Thank you. Uh, that sounds really interesting. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, what you do uh, later on. We can focus on that, but let us also introduce Needy because I'm sure that we have our uh, friends here who are also interested to know what podcast is actually doing. Thanks, Ning. Uh, really happy to be here um, doing this virtually. This is the new, new world. Um, so podcast predicts uh, how cargo moves across the world. We predict the volume and the arrival time of cargo from one port to the other. And we use machine learning and various external data, um, which quantifies the risk that, that's there in shipping. Um, it could be risk due to adverse weather, port congestion, shipping companies making changes, economic patterns, et cetera. So we basically get all of this data and then predict um, and make supply chains more dynamic and resilient. And that's become especially important given what's happening with COVID-19 and this is why we've actually got a lot of inbound interest recently um, to help companies improve their supply chains and take more proactive actions. Um, so I, I believe in the long run, this, this is going to be really positive for supply chain dis digitization. That's great. It sounds like COVID-19 has actually presented more opportunities rather than challenges for the both of you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing, Christina and Lidi. And we both know that uh, the Peer 71 Accelerate program is a very big part of our SmartPod Challenge. Maybe could both of you share a little bit about your experience during this Accelerate program? I think you took part in 2018 and 2019. What were some of the things that you valued and you learned through the program? Maybe can we have Christina to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, our experience with the Accelerator program was overall very good. And as uh, Ning mentioned before, we weren't actually located here in Singapore uh, during the program. So it was very valuable for us that we were actually able to um, attend the master classes remotely. So it almost felt like we were there and we were able to uh, participate in the discussions and uh, the challenges as well during the classes. Thanks. How about Nidhi? Um, yeah, I think. Um you know, the PS71 program overall gave a really good platform to showcase our technology and connect with stakeholders and customers, potential customers across Singapore, um, but also even global customers. So there was a lot of discussions we had with companies, not even in Singapore because of that. I think one of the things that was really valuable was how the demo day was organized and, you know, giving that opportunity to a startup to present to at least 200 people. And I think it was then recorded and put online as well. So I think that allows you, you know, young startups to really reach more companies uh, and try and showcase their technology. So that I think I was, was really the highlight of the program for me. Yeah, yeah and uh, with COVID-19 has forced us to go even, um, I think it has really forced us to step out of our comfort zone. And now with this doing virtually, I dare say that we might have reached uh, more than 300 people uh, yeah. That's probably bigger than our demo day right now. And with it, I guess uh, that's going bigger is the only way to go. I'm not sure if you're still in touch with your mentors, though, from the Accelerate days. Um, I, I think Nidhi was paired with uh, JC and uh, Christina was paired with Chris. We want to know how helpful was it uh, with this mentor startup pairing. But I, I will have to say that the experience for Needy is slightly different because back then it was a one-to-one -one match. And for Christina, you guys, we tried a different uh, format where it was a shared pool of mentor. So you mm -hmm. literally had access to um, the entire pool. Although Chris probably worked with you a little bit more, right? Yeah, that's correct. It was a very good experience having a dedicated um, mentor like Chris and especially the part uh, where his um, or his background is not maritime, it actually forced us out of our comfort zone. And uh, uh, what do you say? They f it forced us to to try and focus on um, um, re uh, rephrasing our unique selling points in order for customers outside the maritime to be to be able to actually understand the problem we're solving here. So that was a really good thing. But as you mentioned, we also had access to, to other mentors, which was really nice. So you also got a more um, nuanced um, input and, and feedback in general on your value propositions. So overall, very good mentor network. 
Um, for us, uh, um, you know, the, I, I really like the one-on-one -on -one sharing uh, and, um, you know, sort of idea exploration that we had with uh, JC in my case, um, because then it was very specific to our business needs. Um, you know, the startups that come to the program all are at very, very different stages of their development and they may have different challenges. Um, so, uh, you know, that one-on-one -on -one sharing was very specific to what we needed at that point of time and how we could progress on those challenges. And then we also had follow-ups after the program ended. So that was, that was really useful. Um, and the masterclasses, I think, was run by multiple people, um, but facilitated by Ronnie. So I think that was also very good because, again, that was a, you know, sort of standard way how startups evolve and key questions that all startups face. So there was both the uh, sort of sharing that we had. Great. So yeah, I gather that um, yeah, being part of the master classes, being having a chance to have one-on-one -on -one mentorship and even having the chance to pitch your idea to a large crowd, these are some of the benefits you have gained thus far. Uh, could you share maybe whether there are any other uh, opportunities that you know, we helped to open up through your participation in Smartboard Challenge? And what else could... Ah! <laughs> Sorry, I think she lost for a while, but uh, it's okay. She's still online. Yeah. So I think she was asking. Besides all these uh, opportunities, is there anything else that you know? Any bonuses that came along for you uh, when you were joining us uh, and during the Smartport Challenge? Yeah. Um, um, for us, it's been like uh, getting a another family or a new family. The whole alumni network has been a really good in initiative. Um, I love the fact that uh, people are using it so actively. Um, and you're a very good facilitator as well, Ning. Uh, you always post if there's something we need help with or if there's anything new you can help us with. For example, if anybody's looking for interns, this is also something you could help us with. Um, we also recently got the opportunity to be featured in um, Asia's uh, blockchain review. And this was also due to the alumni network and us being exposed on uh, PS71's website. So I think in general, the extra attention we've gotten and the fact that you're always very good at uh, sharing uh, different news when we have something anybody uh, writes about us like the piece you had about the female founders where Nidia and I were features, featured that um, again is also very valuable to us as a startup. Yeah well thank you very much for acknowledging that uh, we've been we're happy to help, I guess, uh, even though the program runs, Smartboard Challenge runs annually, but then the kind of support that we extend doesn't really end uh, after pitch day, which is uh, typically kind of like a, a demo day for our alumni. Uh, we, we really have all the, all the intention to grow the alumni network and it can only be successful if everyone pitches in to help one another. So that's really what um, we want to bring up. And what Christina was talking about is, um, well, by virtue of being part of uh, NUS, the so National University of Singapore, we have lots of student talent. So uh, we are more than happy to match interns or even if you're looking for a specific talent, uh, that's where you can shop out as well. But besides that, um, you brought up a really interesting point, right? So there is a Smartport Challenge and that's where, there's also a point where Smartport Challenge ended. And for the both of you, you were recipients of the MPA's grant that is specific for a Smartport Challenge uh, finalist. Um, so maybe can you share a little bit about um, your experience? Uh, what were you doing using that uh, fifty thousand dollars Singapore dollars grant um, with? So maybe Needy can take this first because you are at the end of your. If if not, you're already wrapping up um, your project, right, with uh, one of the corporates. Um, yeah, so we actually uh, got that grant from MPA, uh, supported by a corporate, um, and the idea was to extend our product. And what we were focusing on is not just predicting how the cargo is moving and what's going to be the risk in terms of delay of the cargo, but starting to do more analytics related to carriers. So which carriers are likely to be more reliable for a particular trade lane um, in terms of whether they're going to be on time and whether they're going to meet their transit time. And we use various historical data sets and do machine learning to predict which carriers are more reliable for any particular trade lane across the world. So this is something that the corporate that was involved was going to use and currently they're testing that. Um, so they actually shared data, they did extensive testing with us. Um, and right now, you know, we're basically creating collateral so that we can start discussing this with potential other customers as well. Um, 
So I think, yeah, overall, that, that grant was really helpful in getting the resources and the bandwidth to really extend the product and develop something which is, in, uh, which is going to be valuable for the industry. Um, and just to, um, you know, talk about the previous question as well. So related to this, you know, M I, I want to also highlight the, the role that MPA had played beyond just the grant um, because they really supported on bringing in more connections and also in terms of, you know, promoting roles on the SMF. So they've been very supportive in the whole journey just beyond the ground. Thank you. And I know Christina is one of the very, one of the latest batch, uh, batches of uh, startups that received this grant um, for, from MPA. So I know you haven't really started on your project, but maybe just give us a little bit of a sneak preview into what you guys are going to be doing uh, with this $50,000 grant. Yeah. Well, our test betting partner is the uh, BW Group here in Singapore, as I mentioned earlier. And of course, we're also uh, involving MPA in this because what we want to prove here is that we're ab able to share um, certificates and other documentation traveling from the origin of the um, issuing body to the seafarer and then again to the shipping company and the port state controls officers actually being the ones doing the controls and checking up on authenticity and all this, um, but all in one shared platform. So we eliminate as much manual work as, as we possibly can in this, where we automate the processes from the beginning where a training center or maritime authority press print or issue a certificate, and then all the way where it travels around the value chain and ends up at the seafarer and his employer. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's very early days, as you mentioned, but we're hoping to bring in uh, more uh, maritime authorities. Uh, we're working um, on uh, opening the doors in Marina in the Philippines and also DGF Shipping here, because as you might know, this is where the, the majority of the world seafarers uh, originate from. So if we could have a positive um, success case, so a good case from this. I mean, this would just open up the doors to the rest of the maritime community, we hope. All right. Thank you very much, guys, for taking time to share with us um, on your journey, your experiences. We hope that this session has been useful for those who are listening in right now and you're contemplating whether or not you should join uh, the Smartport Challenge. I think um, everyone should be encouraged to take that leap because you never know what, uh, where, where this journey is going to bring you, right? It's been exciting for the both of you so far, and I can say the same for uh, our alumni as well. Uh, so once again, thank you very much, Christina and Needy, for joining us this afternoon. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah I hope to see you guys again at our next Smart Pro Challenge, or rather the Pure Sign Online event soon. Uh, not virtually, but in person, so that we can actually, you know, uh, clean our beer cups or whatever it is, beer mugs. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Okay. Hope you've enjoyed that panel <laughs> and thank you, Ning, for the teamwork. Welcome back, Jessica. <laughs> so we have time for one question or maybe two questions now. So we have one on our Facebook page asking, will there be an opportunity to talk to challenge owners before the submission date? And the answer to that is yes, there will be an opportunity for interested startups to meet challenge statement owners. And we are planning a series of sessions called Tier 71 Explore, where you can meet these challenge statement owners online and ask them more questions if you have clarifications about their public statement. You can also write into the Tier 71 inquiries email and you can take your questions there. So for the Explore series, sign up through our website or follow us on LinkedIn to find out more. And the next question, Link. Yeah, so someone asked what kind of a support we extend to the PR71 uh, Smartport Challenge alumni. I think uh, Nidhi and Christina did a great job answering them, but maybe uh, we just want to let you know that not many people know we actually, PR71 is also located in Block 71, uh, that is in uh, One North. Uh, in, it's also one of the, well, it's not really one of the, but it is the startup hub in Singapore. So you will get to mingle around with a lot of entrepreneurs. The VCs are just right next door. So it's really vibrant right here. Um, maybe not quite right now with COVID-19 situation and most of them are working from home, but then Pierce and is definitely in right smack in the hub for entrepreneurship in Singapore as well. Just wanted to add that on. Right, so um, what's next? 
So next, I think our next guest has decades of experience in the container shipping business. Yeah, that's so, right. Vlog was the COO of PSA, the terminal operator which handles transshipment in the busiest container transshipment hub in the world. So that's over to him. And good evening to all. And firstly, let me congratulate MPA and PSA one for organizing SPC 2020. In spite of this unusual environment that we're currently in, and my appreciation to you for your invitation to share my perspective on digitization in the maritime industry. Uh, indulge me with a, just a quick self-intro. Spent most of my adult life working in the port. Joined the then Port of Singapore Authority in 1990, which was a port authority of one country of 3 million people, but handling a volume of about three million t uh, 5 million TUs then. I eventually left PSA International in 2018, which was a, by then a global terminal operator in 16 countries, handling a volume of 81 million TEUs. So as you can see, most of my work life was spent on port planning, terminal development, and container operations. My first immersion with technology was in the year 20, 2000, when I was asked to spearhead PSA foray in the dot-com. I set up pornet.com and secured port community system projects in five global sites. Uh, subsequently, in 2015, I was appointed as PSA's first ever CTO, I went on to spend the next three years sensing and making sense of this digital disruption that we're facing, map our digital strategy and laid out our implementation roadmap. I'm now a social volunteer working with underserved students and work with corporates occasionally to help them navigate the digital journey. So the brief today given for the session was to address what startups need to look out for if they're coming in for the first time specifically what types of innovation, digital technology that the industry has been doing and looking at, and whether this would change with COVID-19. And given that my exposure is with the container side of things, I seek an understanding that I'm naturally inclined to confine my sharing to container shipping and terminals. So what was the industry doing with digitization before COVID-19? I think the industry, uh, in a snapshot, was warming up to the idea of digitization and most major stakeholders were taking very concrete steps. They've allocated resources, set up digital organizations, map strategies and transformation route maps, initiated uh, technology POCs to test out the pain points, invested and entered into partnerships with startups and IT companies. So for all of you startups that are new to container shipping, uh, which was never quite a poster boy for technology adoption as the industry was perpetually preoccupied with straight, staying afloat in the highly competitive and commoditized business. Uh, but it's in, it is also in the midst of this consolidation and when the industry decided to focus on rolling out mega ships, that digitization conversation started. Uh, the ships had a price tag of in excess of US 150 to 190 million. And so there were high expectations that these mega ships would be that magic pill to survive and gain a competitive position with extreme economies of scale and new operating efficiency, uh, particularly in fuel consumption then. Um, so happened that these coincident of events, mega ships and digitization, gave us a window and opportunity to go beyond physical upsizing and to tap on digital technology to redesign onboard operating systems, processes and ship infrastructure. This mega ship subsequently triggered the cascade effect to ports and the need to perform and cope with increased scale of operations, both in terms of volume and density. And, to, and while facing constraints of land and labor, ports had to upgrade infrastructure, equipment, and operating systems. As investment capex are large, planners had not much of choice, but ex, and also the extra motivation to look to leverage on digital technology and embed them in upgraded and new infrastructure, equipment, and systems. Uh, partly to justify service levels, improve productivity, cost efficiencies, and also to justify ROIs. So if I were to look back and summarize what were the areas of technologies that were useful to the industry, particularly the container ports and shipping side of things, uh, there are probably four clusters of technologies. I think firstly, digital connectivity. Driven by the pervasiveness of mobile devices and cheap wireless comms, Cloud computing became prevalent in office-based, admin-based processes for easy storage retrieval to share use of data and documents. So that started the ball rolling. Then on board ships and terminal operation shop floors, connectivity was expanded to mount IoT sensors on equipment, on ships, on structures, machineries, 
to support the setup of analytics-based insights to cut wastages and improve cost efficiencies. Some use cases of data analytics that has been tried and implemented uh, are achieving better visibility of machinery conditions and performance, data supported scheduling and execution of maintenance works, cost savings are achieved through dynamic condition-based maintenance instead of the previous static intervals. Secondly, it extends ships and cranes operating lifespan with data acquisition and health monitoring of key components and structures so that preventive changes can be effected before breakdowns happen. The third use case of data analytics were to employ integrated visualization tools so that breakdowns and maintenance repairs can be better coordinated and given the better visibility. Um, another use case would be the use of smart containers, which allows refers containers with high value cargo to be actively monitored while in transit. Last but not least, AR, VR technologies were tested in terminals to complement remote access setup. So the offsite maintenance expert help and support are available 24 by 7. Now the second cluster of technology involves around uh, very hardware, robotics and automation and automation. The use of automation systems on board smart ships, uh, which resulted very quickly in fewer crewing uh, to man, man the ships. For example, integrated computer-based systems, monitors and controls automated installations, and also uh, of areas where uh, machineries are not attended all the time. Another example is smart refer containers having temperature monitored, as I mentioned, without the crew having to make a physical trip to the containers. On the land side, with automated and remote control cranes, AGVs, driverless trucks, ports could reduce many levels and lower its dependency on labor availability to provide always on and uninterrupted operations 24 by 7 and to deliver sustained operation performance. Another smart system, both hardware, very hardware focused, was drones that were developed for inspection of hard to reach places on land, under deck, inside, outside, under ships, with faster, safer, and more accurate inspections when complemented with advanced OCR and video analytics. And finally, where areas where automation was still not quite practical, for example, lashing of containers on board ship, uh, coning, deconing of containers, experimentation of use of robotic arms and exoskeletons to support heavy lift operations to delay the effect of fatigue uh, could potentially sustain uh, longer operations. Now, coming to more software, the third cluster of technologies that were put in place were looking for smarter computers that were powered by AI and machine learning. Uh, this could crunch large volumes of data and support more complex planning and optimized operations. Uh, with ships doubling in size, um, lots of volumes of containers to be handled, um, some of the decisions and data points that were given were just humanly impossible to handle. Now, digi digital visualization, simulator, simulation tools provided an alternative to human imagination, enable users to see effect of decisions on outcomes in virtual environment before they are executed in live environments. Um, smart systems on board ships using analytics, AI, help the master plan and make decisions to optimize fuel efficiency, as well as things like uh, optimizing sailing roads and speed uh, so that you can reduce uh, fuel consumption, trim optimization uh, with uh, AI-assisted storage allocation. Finally, automated equipment monitoring system on board ships with self-diagnostics, self-recovery, and uh, providing remote access also serve to provide higher availability and improve reliability. At the landside terminal, smart tour systems with AI optimization could be used to handle complex and larger interdependent resource scheduling, space management, equipment and ops coordination. Advanced power monitoring systems on board cranes can regenerate and reduce electrical consumption used by the cranes. Analytics were, analytics were used in the big way for forecasting of container demands geographically, although not always with the good results, to plan repositioning so the cost of unnecessary empty repositioning could be avoided uh, and customer service could be improved. One last point on smart system was the, uh, the introduction of cloud-based collaboration software that facilitated joint planning uh, with partners. Uh, example, network planning, scheduling, pooling and sharing of assets. 
We also saw the use of collaborating systems, collaborative systems such as Esvela, to synchronize onboard storage plans with terminal yard distributions so that crane productivity can be improved and ship turnaround time can be shortened. Finally, the fourth cluster of, digit, uh, of um, technology that were used were in managing digital workflows and platforms. So now, in, there are probably three types of platforms. I think one, there were traditional platforms such as sport community systems, online uh, websites that facilitated electronic shipping transactions, planning of containers, booking of slots, track and trace, information and documentation exchange, um, usually, usually using EDI, Gate shadowing and operations workflow management were offered on port community systems and online booking platforms. New technologies such as cloud and blockchain and AI enabled traditional platforms to upgrade and expand their functionalities, as well as integrate with other trade and logistics supply chain platforms uh, were also became, became available with digitization. Example, Intra uh, with uh, E2 Open. The second cluster of platforms were new marketplace and data sharing platforms. For example, port based in the port of Rotterdam, Freitos, Frexport, Holio, which promoted data sharing and reduces data rehandling, streamlined uh, digital workflows, and, asset, and actually also provided new marketplace uh, type of asset sharing uh, using the Uber model to enable equipment owners a better collaboration and pooling of resources to maximize their utilization. Finally, the last group of platforms would be the next generation platforms in partnerships with IT giants. For example, GSBN, Global Shipping Business Network, Trade Lens, which is a partnership between MERS and IBM, Kalista, a PSA initiative with GATS, are digital collaboration platforms that were formed by carriers, ports, customs, banks, shippers, logistics service providers uh, that cuts across the supply chain. The use of blockchain technology to digitize automate and connect trade financing, regulations, regulatory documentation, logistics documentation flows with multi-party access to update and share consolidated information on a single shared view. This increases visibility, speed, minimizes our costly hiccups and movement costs by documentation errors. I guess the eventual objective of such platforms would be to synchronize the where, which is the IoT or physical goods, with what, what has been approved, how has it been processed, what is the status of approval, which is the IoT or documents, to enable a merger, a better synchronization of forecasting and coordination of logistics flow. Um, the next question that I would like to tackle was that with COVID-19, has focus area shifted? And if yes, what are the new focus area? Um, I guess it's no, it's no brainer as COVID definitely has affected everybody. It's turned the pages for everyone to actually a level footing. It curtailed the option to continue work as usual, disrupted traditional rules and processes as companies seek to protect workers, maintain continuity of business and service to customers. So I think the four clusters that I talked about earlier, digital connectivity, automation, robotics, smart systems and platforms, our foundation pieces of digitization in the industry to resolve bread and butter issues and they will not go away. In fact, the urgency is even there more now than before as shipping, as you will know, is gravely affected by the drop in volumes, the change, likely changes of vol volume flows and new operating constraints, which I think will accelerate digital solutions so that business can continue and players can emerge stronger. Now, one key advantage that COVID or key major change that COVID has, has done to all of us, it has broken barriers in traditional mindset and probably will be a strong instigator of cultural changes. Hence, it is the right environment for digital change to happen. I think three urgent areas uh, in the industry will deserve attention and uh, potential opportunities for startups. Um, one, I think contactless, remote telecommuting, process automation, particularly in backroom planning and support functions uh, were accelerated. Now, now that digital is seen as a viable option compared to the inconveniences of additional risk mitigating measures, having to get to work in, in, in offices and, and shop floors, people are more prepared to live with imperfections in new processes and systems as long as business can continue. 
Now, culture changes in organization uh, are, are definitely going to happen because management and workforce are more prepared now, uh, um, will be more prepared now to adapt to rigid work processes, which transcend across previously what would be I call rigid functional silos. So, and technology will, will definitely play a huge role here for that to happen. Finally, I think workforce, the workforce is definitely more willing to rely on digital chat channels and tools to do their work. But the, there are limitations to doing a lot of work off-site. And they will actually look forward to increase use of machines so that uh, machines can augment men uh, for decisions to be taken more expediently. Uh, automated decisions could also be done so that there are no hold up even when an employee is not online in, or in the office. I think the, the second area of potential opportunity would be um, the use of variables that I can think of um, with particular increased focus on safety to protect workers, to protect crew, um, working on board ships and cranes, um, the need for trackers, smart trackers for identi identification of location, density count, violation of no-go zones to conduct safe maintenance, um, use of safe watch, shirt, material, new materials to detect vital signs, health monitoring, uh, personnel um, checks, video analytics for safety and safe and security env enforcement uh, will all be new areas uh, that will require a lot of attention. The third urgent area I, or third area of change that I will see with COVID will really be the push and increased participation in uh, smart next generation end-to-end -end platforms. As government and businesses will want to reconfigure supply chains to re strengthen resilience and particularly to have better visibility uh, and ability to, to orchestrate and synchronize movements. So new visibilities are required for in order to track inventory, to anticipate and cushion movement disruptions, as well as to ensure continuity of source of goods, in particular critical ones such as food and healthcare. Uh, during this crisis and probably the next crisis and over and over again. Now, um, I would like to leave you really with, with some thoughts on what could be like, likely upcoming tech trends um, or maybe probably leave you with three questions. Um, I think number one is, um, could we have more realistic expectations of what machine could do or should do? Uh, and finding the right balance of man and machine collaboration uh, in the various, various areas of, of pain points that we have on board ships and in terminal. I think we shouldn't be in a hurry. Should we really be in a hurry to take, out, take the man out of the equation? And what were the right pickings for automation? Um, whatever that has, could be automated easily without resistance, without problems, would have been automated. I think going forward, man-machine collaboration uh, which is important so that we can tap both sides for what they do best. Uh, processes could be redesigned to enable machine learning, AI machines to perform parameterized decisions, but with support from data insights and they can learning from men or data points that were used in decisions or non-routine decisions. That combination of man machine, the right combination uh, uh, is something worth looking at. I think the fusion of technologies to adapt to integrated solutions will be in very much demand. Uh, previously, startups come uh, with very singular technology. They, they want to pitch the, the, the best of the technologies. Um, I think going forward, solutions are needed rather than single technologies. Uh, example, uh, IoT platforms that are paired with touch sensors, 3D machine vision, so better sensing, uh, machine learning software, behavioral and analytics, could work together to, a form a more, to offer a more holistic solution offering uh, for safety management. Now, if startups do not have, uh, obviously startups will not have uh, access to all of this. Um, so it is also a, time, a timely opportunity to consider collaboration with other startups so that when you approach corporates, it's an integrated solution. Now, in cases where techs are not techno technologies are not ready, but there are practical when there are practical implementation issues, we could consider man-guided machines for solutions. For example, truck platooning, which is one man driving a few tr automated trucks following the, the man-driven truck. Adaptive, another example would be adaptive robots for cloning, decoding operations, where there's still a man in the loop. Uh, it could be one man with three robots uh, that, uh, that allow this new generation of robots with self-learning 3D computer, computer machine vision capabilities to work together 
to, to in, in the cloning and decoding of containers. I think the second question I have uh, or point that I want to make uh, about going forward, it's really about standards. I think it's been a topic that's been talked a lot. Um, my point is there will be likely proliferation of platforms and hence across, hence across the board, data standardization, especially across platforms, will involve a lot, a multitude of stakeholders and surely take a very long time. Um, so do we really have the luxury of waiting for full standardization? Are there technologies or solutions to work around to ensure interconnectivity between platforms across different domains? Can tech innovation address this? Uh, uh, in, in, and I think anybody who has that, that winning, winning solution uh, will, will score big time in this. Last but not least, I, cyber security, uh, it's, it's going to be there. I think we had a MERS incident in 2017. We had a Costco incident in 2018. We have an MSC incident in 2020. So the signs are there. Um, and given the mixed mesh of legacy systems with different levels of readiness to tackle cyber threats and having more connectivity to, and more platforms, um, the risk is going to be there. Can tech innovations address more intuitive cybersecurity uh, to, to cover the gaps that, that is, uh, that's going to be even more apparent uh, going forward? Now with that, I hope um, I have shared with you enough view of the industry. Good luck to all of you. Uh, may you have fun and may you um, prosper in your conversation with the corporates. Thank you. Thank you, Vilok, for that last uh, well wishes. And rightfully so, one of the one of one of the questions that came in through Pigeon Hall is: Does an existing startup need to go through the Accelerate program? Is there an avenue to engage the companies directly for specific problem statements? Now, I'd like to say that the chosen finalists will have to go through the Pierce and Own Accelerate program. Uh, it's part of it, and then that is also one of the terms and conditions. Uh, to qualify for the up to three thousand uh, dollars grant that's being put out by MPA, and secondly, after this launch event, we will be engaging the corporates for uh, sessions every Thursday. So do watch out our LinkedIn uh, page for more news, or just subscribe to our newsletters. Uh, during those sessions, we we'll invite the corporates to share a bit more, and then you will be able to interact to ask questions uh, and and share more uh, on what you do with the corporates as well. Thanks, Neil. So we're running slightly late, but we're at our very last segment for the day. It's also the longest call by distance that we are making. We have Mira Gatsman, all the way from Israel, co-founder and COO of the Doc Innovation. Hello, there. So hello, everyone, and thank you, uh, Smartport Challenge and Peer71, for giving me the opportunity to share our insights with the, with the ecosystem. It's uh, our pleasure to continue the collaboration that uh, started from our side at least uh, in the last couple of years. And we enjoy uh, the synergies between uh, the vibrant maritime cluster and the vibrant innovative cluster of Israel to collaborate together in order to deliver a better future uh, for the maritime world and from the entire ecosystem. Uh, so I asked by uh, by Peer Seventy One uh, team to share uh, three main uh, areas uh, regarding the uh, the current uh, situation. One is what is happening around the COVID nineteen and the implication around the local Israeli market. Second, what we experience and learn from the international market, from our partners and from our ecosystem in the global port shipping and logistics sector. And third, how we can collaborate between ecosystems like DOC in Israel, Pier 71 in Singapore, Sea Head in, uh, in Boston, Port Excel in uh, Rotterdam and such to, uh, to accelerate uh, the collaboration and the activities between startups and corporates. So I will start by saying that uh, from an overall perspective of the COVID crisis in Israel, uh, we experience a pretty uh, modest implication compared to the rest of Europe thanks to a very uh, early and strong um, 
uh, activity from the Israeli government and authorities that started the lockdown pretty early compared to most of the region. And uh, most of the health providers and the, um, the facilities and the infrastructures hold steady all along the, the crisis. And now we are already in decline with the number of new cases and uh, new deaths. And hopefully we are close to, uh, uh, to start uh, getting things to normal. So this is the good part. Uh, the toughest part and the more challenging part is the implication of the economy because we are just finalized a few months of complete uh, lockdown and complete uh, shutdown of the airline industry, tourist industry, restaurants, uh, consumer consumption, etc. And this is uh, implicate all the supply chain, all the demand in the, in the commercial and private sector and uh, affect all the players, whether it will be uh, uh, logistic providers, uh, commercial retailers, or even, uh, um, even people in the leisure or travel tourism that actually uh, uh, stop to zero most of their activities. Uh, this is a result end up in a lot of uh, less spending from the population. And all the trade uh, 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 value chain has become uh, much more constrained. Uh, and the effect is also can be shown on the logistics sector. What I can say for, for good is that uh, unlike the airline sector or the restaurants in the street, uh, the global supply chain mostly uh, continue to uh, to move and to keep uh, the, uh, the global trade moving, both for medical supplies and foods, etc., for things that uh, were in need. And it's mostly thanks to the, uh, to the responsible management of the global corporates and governments around the world, as well as the average uh, sailors and uh, sea workers all around the world. There is a uh, few millions of them that, uh, that uh, face a tough situation without, uh, uh, without any opportunity to replace teams and to, uh, to come back home during all this crisis and help all of us to, to keep the routine uh, as smooth as possible. So I want to leverage this opportunity also to thank them everywhere around the world and also around our uh, participants. Regarding what we uh, experience from the global maritime sector, uh, corporate sports shipping companies. Uh, I can show it to you that uh, as we also uh, host a webinar series dedicated for this specific issue, uh, in the dock in the last couple of months. We experienced many cases where the COVID-19 era is actually played as a digitalization catalyst for the market from the sole reason that uh, without a digital platform that uh, enable a trade flow, cargo lease, cargo monitoring, without face-to-face -face interaction, and the physical attendance of agents, uh, etc., uh, is mandatory uh, in order to keep uh, the supply chain moving uh, alongside keeping the social distancing uh, uh, restrictions. Uh, so in this respect, there is uh, some companies that are dealing, uh, for example, with the streamlining and AI platform for custom clearance, for digital bill of lading, uh, for help in uh, ship navigation and collision avoidance. That, as I mentioned before, most of the teams are tired and spent a lot more time in the sea in their contract than they expected to be. And uh, the startups that was in the right spot in the right time that can deliver these products and this solution to the market. Uh, actually experience a lot more traction than before the crisis. 
And uh, as the saying goes, uh, never waste a good crisis. I can say that uh, uh, there is uh, great uh, examples that uh, you can see also in the slide that will be around in the background from, uh, from the doc webinars that we hosted recently about companies that together with the corporates that they collaborate with, uh, open uh, new opportunities and uh, new engagement, specifically during the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And I can say that uh, the good part of it is that uh, even people that was um, uh, risk averse and not ready to accept change before the COVID-19 era, uh, found, find out that they can rely on digital platform and on uh, communication technologies that they are now stable enough, reliable enough, and trusted enough by all parties, from the banks, from the importers, exporters, shipping companies, ports, etc., and can support the needs of the global supply chain. So to give a broader overview of these, uh, of these implications, I can share that uh, from our perspective, some uh, solutions that just a few months ago was nice to have, or sometimes uh, new tools by, uh, by innovative or ready to adapt uh, uh, corporates around the world. Uh, uh, to do better marketing for their uh, new solutions or, need, or try to bring uh, traction from the more uh, young generation of uh, workers that entering the industry, like millennials and Gen Z, and Gen Z, uh, Gen Z that are looking for digital platform. Today, there is a widespread acceptance by all generations that uh, digital platforms are here and appear to stay and stable enough to support all the needs. Uh, the question is uh, if the startups and the early platform are uh, ready and uh, uh, advanced enough to deliver a rapid growth and early roll and uh, fast rollout of their solutions and to keep the promise running uh, for all their new customers. And this is a big challenge for new startups that try very hard to uh, commit the traction, uh, to scale very fast, to make sure we can support all, uh, all the new users. And uh, hopefully this will, use, uh, this will be used by the industry also to validate who is the most talented uh, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, startups out there that can really deliver the promise. Uh, the third part that I uh, want to mention that uh, I asked by our partners to be from Peer 71 is how we can collaborate uh, in order to make sure that uh, even during the crisis and less money involved and less capital is free to invest in new platform and in new uh, solutions that uh, help companies to, uh, to thrive during this uh, back to normal or maybe the global crisis that we are facing uh, in the general economy. Uh, I think that now is more important than any time else in the history to keep these tracks open between us, between Pier 71, the DOC, uh, by making in Hamburg and in Copenhagen and see ahead in, in Boston and such in order to make sure that uh, once we don't find the best solution in our local ecosystem for the needs of our partners, we can easily and openly uh, find and collaborate with other ecosystems. I don't think that any specific ecosystem can uh, solve the problem of the entire global supply chain, the entire world. Uh, there is always a competition between talented and uh, great innovators and entrepreneurs between different areas of the world. And uh, we need to make sure that the best one will prevail and will prove the promise that, as I mentioned before, 
it's not only a necessity of the, the specific time, but also a start of a new era, transparent, open, and digital, uh, and hopefully more sustainable, uh, very time, uh, very time world. Uh, in order to um, to succeed in this huge vision, we have to make sure that we leverage our uh, resources and assets to support both in our local ecosystem and if there is uh, uh, better solutions out there, so to collaborate with other ecosystems in order to support them. And to give a specific example is uh, that if we learn from our global partners that are both uh, PSA from Singapore and Kirby, the inland barge operator from the US, with, uh, with uh, Thyssen Group as a shipbuilding uh, company from, uh, from Europe in the middle. Uh, we learn from global partners about challenges. And once we recognize such solution in the local ecosystem, this will be great. And uh, if uh, investors or additional partners with the same challenges from Singapore or from Boston, want to engage and enjoy the same, uh, the same solution, we are always happy to collaborate to open our uh, uh, know-how and, uh, uh, and the startup that we are looking into for the benefit of uh, any other ecosystem and also the other way around, meaning uh, we are approaching other accelerators and platforms in the maritime sector and also outside of the maritime sector to look for a solution that can best solve the needs of our global partners. And once we recognize such uh, as, uh, as the obligation to our partners, we should prefer the best solution and not only the best solution that we find locally in Israel. Meaning if we find the best solution for a specific uh, challenge of a port operator, uh, and it could be a port operator from Singapore or from Hamburg. And we find this solution from a company in UK. So uh, we will approach this company in UK. We will help them uh, bridge the gap uh, between their culture and the corporate culture and help them thrive together with the corporates that we are dealing with. And hopefully if they will be interesting enough and there will be a success during this uh, process, will also be interesting to engage in a venture investment in this company. And then maybe we will find ourselves uh, co-invest in a company in the UK together with Rainmaking from Copenhagen that see the same uh, opportunity. I mention it as a specific uh, uh, opportunities that I can see in the future that will help the entire ecosystem to thrive and to make sure that uh, by collaboration and by transparency between us, different ecosystems and different geographical patch, uh, we are uh, delivering to the, to the global supply chain and to the global sector the best solution out there. Uh, moreover, I uh, I'm openly invite each and every one of you of, uh, of the participants and the collaborators and the partners of Pier 71 to directly approach us. Uh, we are by, by design easy to approach and open in all our social media platform in order to do it uh, easy as possible uh, to approach, to talk and to consult with us in any idea that uh, uh, we might get from any of a uh, few out there uh, in order to, to help the entire, uh, the entire local ecosystem in Singapore and the global one. So thank you very much for, for allowing me to, to share these insights. Uh, again, more than happy to, uh, uh, to do it uh, with you, Peer 71, that I think you are doing a great job in, uh, in uh, delivering innovation to the sector. And looking forward for my next uh, physical in-place uh, visit to Singapore and to host you here as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Nir. And that's it, folks. This is the last speaker we have lined up for you today. I'm terribly sorry we overran. We're just so excited because we have not met uh, many of our speakers today for months. Anyway, uh, I thought we'd like to do a recap of today's session. So let me just check in with Jessica and see whether she was paying attention. Absolutely. Okay, so Jessica, if you're a startup with technologies to reimagine for the maritime industry, what should you know about the Smartport Challenge 2020 this year? Well, me, if I'm a startup, I think my key takeaways from today are firstly, reimagine my technologies for any of the 17 innovation opportunities from Smartport Challenge. So I'll scan the QR code to head over to the website to find out more. Secondly, I'll be sure to submit my proposal before the 10th of August, 2359 Singapore time. And that's the QR code to the registration page on the screen right now. And lastly, I must subscribe to the newsletter and follow Pier 71 on LinkedIn for the latest events and especially for more discussion sessions with the participating organizations. As we've mentioned, we've got Pier 71 Explore lined up. So join us every Thursday at 4 p.m. to deep dive into the challenges. That's beautifully captured. So I see that she has been listening. So for those that join us meet, right? if you're not, you can find out more about Pier 71 Smartport Challenge on our website, and that is www.peersandyone.sg. We will also be reposting the video we have today on YouTube and on our Facebook page. So subscribe, hit the like button, and share the video. So once again, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did hosting you. So keep safe, and we hope to see you very soon. Bye. Bye.